So today, we will discuss the, the activities of international tribunals with regard to universal jurisdiction. Well, to talk about this topic, it is necessary to focus on the practical activity of the jurisdictional bodies. In. Therefore, it is necessary to talk about the scope and then about the main players. Well, regarding the function, regarding the role, from the historical perspective of the judicial power makes it necessary to approach a question which I believe is of high interest. That is to say, according to Montesquieu, the strategic function or role of the judicial power is the one that is given to the division of power the judicial power, as well as uh, to counteract the legislative power and executive power. So therefore, now I'd like to you to reflect upon the following. What is the strategic function of the supranational judicial power? Well, according to Montesquieu, structure, well, the, it is intended at dividing the power of the regime. What is the power of division that international powers, international tribunals have? Or other, in other words, what is the absolute power that should be divided with the supranational judicial power? So <clears throat> this is the question that I would like to put forward regarding the strategic role of the supranational judicial power. It is our concern as experts and professionals of justice that actually the judicial power, supranational judicial power, we want it to play an effective role because of what we are discussing about the exercise of the role of tribunals. We want them to control and to take care of the breakdown of supranational judicial power. So regarding the scope, the scope of jurisdiction, well, the issues or the topics that we are discussing in this relevant conference that are organized by the Justice Garrison Foundation, which I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate because of the success of this conference. Well, the scope that we are interested in is the use punienti. Therefore, we are not discussing other levels of supranational jurisdiction. Here I refer to civil level, mercantile level. The exercise of use punienti, that means the need to have a declarative capacity, the capacity that tribunals have. This is a formal capacity in terms of stating what is fair and what is just and what it is unjust. So, therefore, based on the necessary guarantees and regarding some be well behaviors and actions. However, this recrimination can only be effective if it comes accompanied with an effective capacity for this recrimination to be effective. With this, I mean that use penalty is not helpful is that it is not accompanied by the vis puniente, that is to say, the power to punish. Well, because we are talking about these concepts, these concepts can be supranational. Use puniente, it could be supranational. However, the force or the enforcement of uh, the possibility to enforce punishment 
has no material framework or no geographical framework which goes beyond the states. Oh, states always enforce the vis puniente. Use puniente could be autonomous, however, vis puniente is always delegated by the states. The prisons to put people in are located in a given territory. There are no territories with uh, prisons outside or beyond the states. So therefore, we are facing a problem here. We are facing a question. Do we need to go back to talk about delegated sovereignty, or we are talking about the provision on the part of the state of their vis puniente? And at the end, at last, well, the main players uh, exercising the supranational judicial power poses an initial problem, a problem that has to be pointed out at this point in time. It's been often said that we should avoid the risk of going into jurisdictional neocolonialism. According to some authors, some authors say that it should be avoided that the Europeans, well, the Europeans put the justice and the non-Europeans put, no, the Europeans put the judges and the non-Europeans put the uh, justice. So therefore, in this conference, it has been highlighted, it has been evidenced that we, uh, Europe, and European judges do not have the will to participate in this type of critic or this uh, trend regarding uh, neocolonialism, because this is questionable. So some of us, to some extent or to a good extent, belong to the European Association for Freedom, MEDEL Association. I am a member of it, and I, have, I am one of the co-founders. <clears throat> so soon we will have European elections. And we, from the association, we have produced a document, a document that I've been asked to read out to you. Even though I uh, will move on right away to introduce the panelists of this first round table, I would kindly ask the organizers to allow me or to read out these documents, because I believe that it is important. And as you may have seen, it is related, it is connected to the topic we'll be discussing this morning. It says as follows. Democracy requires independent courts and prosecutors. Independent and active justice is just essential for the development of the awareness about the social relevance of fundamental rights. Fundamental rights that are the basis for justice, for the internal justice of each country. And obviously, because of the same reason, they are just essential, fundamental for having a, an effective enforcement of universal jurisdiction. In democracy, one of the principles that is enshrined for all the citizens is that the poli policy makers are, as well as the citizens, have to respect the obligations and the rights enshrined in the treaties, declarations, and in the declarations of fundamental rights. Therefore, these are the ones that we are interested in when we discuss universal jurisdiction. The defense of a citizenship which is fully national and European as well as worldwide requires or acquires two key dimensions. First of all, guaranteeing the norms of uh, 
compelling the rights and then the effective enforcement of these rights. This is what we will be discussing in this roundtable. All the national constitutions, declarations of rights, as well as the European treaties have given to the tribunals the right and the duty of not allowing the enforcement of laws that go against the, or contravene the constitution or laws that breach the fundamental rights stated in these declarations. Based on its protection before the European Court, European citizens have the guarantee to, uh, that their rights are enforced and to require interpretation of these rights. Therefore, it is mandatory that both nationally as well as Europe, at the European level, we would achieve consolidation as well as harmonization of an independent justice system that is available and accessible to all the citizens. This would only be possible by the construction of uh, legal and democratic culture that would allow us to interpret and to read the law from a democratic viewpoint that would ensure at all times the effective enforcement of all the rights in a twofold manner, as social rights as well as political rights. Enforcement of public freedoms can only be achieved fully in, in whenever there is a social, cultural, and material situation allowing free elections. On the other hand, social rights can only survive or prevail in so much as there are public freedoms to defend them and to, to advocate for them and to go deeper into them. Nowadays, European citizens support political and social rights as inalienable rights. So this is a set of uh, rights which is not open to negotiation that are not dependent on the market, that are inherent to human dignity. However, enforcement of political and social rights should not be understood as uh, irreversible success or achievement could be attacked from many sources and control of political decisions carried out by the economical and financial power leads to more dangers and threats. That is to say, threats to the fundamental rights of citizens. In the negotiations, such as the ones carried out about the free trade area, transatlantic free trade area, there have been attempts to place transnational companies at the same levels that sovereign, free, sovereign states, establishing arbitration courts to settle disputes between companies and states, allowing the possibility of not respecting the democratic, the laws that have been democratically approved and that defend the rights of uh, citizens. Therefore, we require courts, prosecutors, and lawyers that are independent uh, so that they can defend these enforcements of these rights freely. So each fundamental right and its uh, guarantee should be ensured. So, therefore, deepening into these rights should be done from uh, at the national level and also within the judi European uh, judicial legal bodies. All the international tribunals are European tribunals. And I would say that all the national tribunals are world tribunals. Active, an active and independent justice is essential to develop an awareness as to the social importance of fundamental rights. It is essential to, for the defense and strengthening of uh, democracy. The principle of independence of tribunals is, in this sense, also fundamental rights. Support or defense of an institute that ensures true and independent activity of European tribunals contributes to fundamental rights to European citizenship and to the strengthening of democracy. 
a united Europe must be built on the citizens' rights and must be served by an independent justice system and must not be built on, only on the freedom of the markets. For a true European citizenship, we require true European legislature. So this is uh, the end of the document that we have produced. From this declaration, that well, this declaration links or connects the perspective of the forces of the European law with the topics that we will be discussing today. That is to say, the enforcement of universal jurisdiction criteria at a supranational level. Therefore, for that, we have with us today, we have Jose Ricardo Di Prado Solaesa. He is a judge of the criminal division of the mm, National High Court of Spain. Well, his CV is uh, really lengthy, and well, he told me not to read it from beginning to end, to end but still he allowed me to tell, me to tell you that he was a speaker of the convention that sentenced Adolfo Schilingo, the Argentinian Adolfo Schilingo, and it was drafted from the table, from a table in a hotel in Sarajevo. Therefore, given the date when this was drafted, when this conviction was drafted, drafted, it has an extraordinary importance, and this is not pure anecdotes. Second, we have Kristen Mercer. Merced. Well, apologies for not pronouncing your surname properly. Well, I cannot really do it. I cannot really do it. Michelle, she is the European coordinator for the coalition for the International Criminal Court. It is an international network bringing together 2,500 civil society organizations across 150 countries. They work in in a coordinated manner to offer justice, to provide justice to the victims of war crimes and crimes against uh, humanity and genocide. She is a lawyer, an expert in these topics, international justice, and she focuses on what well, she's got an expertise on the enforcement of the Rome Statute in the European region. She joined the coalition in 2007, and she has been the leader of the European Department of the Coalition since 2011. She is responsible for implementing the campaigns of the uh, coalition in across 54 countries and in Eastern Central Asia, with the objective to ensure universal ratification as well as the internal enforcement to get the support from European states, uh, regional association, the Rome Statute, as well as the fulfillment of the complementarity principle. Before she joined the coalition, she worked in the economic development sector, as she focused on the interrelationships and focused on fair trade she has a degree from the University of New York, from Amsterdam, and from the Institute of International and Strategic Relationship, where she's got a degree in political sciences, international relations, as well as humanitarian studies. Helen Duffy, now. OK. Well, you can see I'm not, uh, I'm not gifted for languages. Right. Uh, she is a lawyer and expert in human rights. She is the director of human rights. Oh, sorry, I cannot pronounce that. It's an organization to ensure justice, fighting against impunity after reaching severe 
international rights. She has led, uh, supported significant cases within the inter-American, European and African cases as well as international bodies and in international courts. For 10 years, she was the legal director of Interrights. She was a legal official of the ICC for the former Yugoslavia, advisor in legal justice of Human Rights Watch and legal director of CALDH Guatemala and also legal advisor of the research on the weapons in Iraq and she also worked for the UK government amongst her publication. Well, we have one well, whose title is here in English, but actually the thing is that I cannot pronounce it. Well, she is a teacher at the master's degree of human rights at the University of Leiden. She is an honorary professor of international law at the University of Glasgow. She's got a degree from the University of Glasgow, University College London, Edinburgh, and Leiden. She is advisor of several non uh, NGOs. Hugo Relva. He must have a very long CV as well as an extraordinary experience because I've been given just a very short presentation for him. He is the legal advisor of the legal team of international amnesty, former advisor of the coalition for the ICC, author of several articles including one whose title is State Jurisdiction and International Law Crimes, Implementation of the Rome Statute and Principle of Jur Universal Jurisdiction and another one about the Statute of Rome in Latin America. So we will open the round session now, the round table now. I uh, did not intend to talk for as long as I talked. However, I thought that it was fair, was just to read out the, our declaration so that we can give entity to our association Medel that brings together more than 15,000 European judges. So they are with us. They are participating. They are adhering to our effort, to the effort that we are making to defend universal jurisdiction as in people who enforce it and also the enforcement of universal jurisdiction from the international, national and regional.